hi, I've decided to share with you my great unfinished novel. Um, I wrote it at a time in my life when I was more or less at different times delusional and off my medication. Um, and at some points in the book, um, I wasn't delusional, I was on my medication. But, um, it's kind of an inside view of being mentally ill and dealing with society being mentally ill. Um, there's no copyright on it, so if you're one of those people who likes to steal other people's work, it's completely available, I guess you could say. I don't know, whatever. I mean, it is mine, but there's no copyright on it. Um, it's also unfinished. I was actually committed for six months to a long-term psychiatric center um, and never finished it. So there's chapters missing, but I think you can kind of um, patchwork the story with your own imagination. Anyway, it's called Lessons of the Hidden Children, A Delusion in Prose. Here lies one Echo Ostara, 222. To ghost dance. Book one, a freneticness in the center of the known universe. The soul flees just at the very moment when we seem to hold its gleaming splendor in all our hands, and all we are left with is one more dead butterfly to add to our molding correct moldering collection. Krishna Prem. Journal entry number one, sometime. Here goes. Spirit, the fifth element, has a dragon. Does that make any sense? Well, it's something I read somewhere in an occult book. Scary, right? Well, my mom was, no, is a cult. She is unknown, hidden, a secret. Some would and did find her scary. I never did, but I've only known her. She could have never hold the mystique of a stranger, so I'll try to explain here. I'll try to explain everything because so much of these things, like the Dragon of Spirit, I've taken for granted. And they are not granted, it seems. It seems nothing is granted except math. Math is the only language, as far as I know, that you can speak freely in. You can work out equations leading to alternate universes in the midst of society. But it's quite a different problem to say it's possible you'll shoot the president, but it is possible of all of us. I may be painting myself the fool, but I'll take it as a given that particular book I am drawing this spirit dragon from isn't underlined, dog-eared, and marginally noted, consuming the length and breadth of your coffee table like it did my mom's. I never read the whole thing, but a couple of weeks ago I saw it in a store and this description kind of sunk in, and I knew I was in a unique place to let my little light shine. So, Mom, I'm your witness. The book is Al Majid, The Majestic. I think I do understand, somehow I do, and it doesn't seem strange at all. We seem strange, we have it all wrong. Every element has a dragon, earth, water, fire, and all those dragons are like strange phantoms. A phantom of the gentle zephyr, dragon of the lake, all their special qualities. Spirit is different, because what is spirit anyway? Nothing we can know, and something we can't forget. The dragon of spirit follows suit, moves quickly one way, almost indecisively quickly another, is neither here nor there. Or if one can think of a beautiful deer in all its gracefulness in a snow-covered forest, then how unsettling that gratefulness would be in a house or a department store. These are the things that come to mind when I think of my mom. Some of us think it's all an illusion, a dream. That's faith, but that illusion is an illusion bred into the fibers of ourselves. Maya is the ways, the means, and the objective, well-lettered, full of good things. American, right on the money. Dharma is a cardboard box filled with two-edged swords. From there, it's a propaganda, self-deception as if grandiose, intimately more real, a dream turned lucid. And Pharaoh receives the alert and subdues those bumps in the night, fails at length and rolls over. What right do I have to go about waking anyone? Who is to cross the line and take the next philosopher's stone? Pharaoh. It's always so. My mother vacillates at times on things like this. 
and who knew she wouldn't break Omerta when tried by fire? Shielding the uninitiated, she bore the elixirs and stumbling stones of the most adamant philosophers. The realists, forgetful, conflicted, on the offense. So this dragon of my mother, quintessential, wore a thin cloak of personality, a cloak to get by in the world, not enough for that purpose in the end, a mask to wear when sopping, so that people wouldn't have to be uncomfortable at our soundless, mirroring abyss. No one would have to look deeply into their own void, into the charged empty of a hollow soul, into the nothing of all things. The manager in training, when talking to her and trying to get in her pants, could overlook a nose out of place, or one eye that looked like it were drawn in finger paint. So unobtrusively do the rent bales of negative existence go a-flopping in the wind. As much more so would her passing of beeline snowflake pattering stuttering ends and words that begin with letters like C or M. She never told me what this routine of her was all about, but I smile in the dark. I simply laughed, young as I was, when she would say in a conspiratorial tone, We've got real tomatoes, Charlie, or things like that. And people that were trying to engage her in inane dialogue would get a little nervous. Who can lay hands on the wind? Heart of the Scorpion Kenny's mother leaned over his left shoulder. He half sat on the floor of the living room coloring. The living room itself was a kind of warm inlet of the various halls, one to the kitchen, to the bedroom and guest room, another to Kenny's room and the bathroom. At his age, he could get lost in a way. The living room television listened to the sound of its own voice. Rebecca had been turning here and back making dinner, weaving the web that becomes life, making it look as though it wove itself. Keep between the lines, unheeded. No, dear, color in the shapes, that's what makes it look real. When you hit a line, stop. Do you know what I mean? No, I don't want to do it that way. She took a slight sigh. Let it go, she thought. The phone began to ring. She counted them off. One, two, three. She did not she did know that what was on the other end. She could pick up the receiver. Oh, he's been in a car accident, but he's okay, just a couple of fractures. At such and such hospital. No, it won't be that. Yes, okay, thank you. No, I'll be fine. Thank you. Her hovering wavered. How much sound did the phone make going back on the wall? She went back into the kitchen, stirred the rice. It fell over on itself in empathy. She turned the stove off. It was the simplest thing. Done. When Jesus was betrayed and the soldiers came to take him, someone fled naked. Didn't bother to fix his garment, just ran. Is that because God was dying or because the method would be so brutal? Propped against the kitchen counter, she watched Kenny from a distance, a strange length. He was coloring in the lines, seeming to like the idea. Rebecca walked that length to him, vigilantly, past framed pictures. She became the th aware of the smells that transformed in this or that area of the house, one into another. That Lysol could shift into a draft of winter vacant in two paces. Then he was under her shadow again. Come on, we're going out for dinner. She slung open the closet, fleshed her arms through leather sleeves, yet another smell. It was hard just for her to watch him as they were leaving. She thought he knew, not really, just understood, in empathy, that he seemed so strong and so small. He followed her out of the door in sure paces, wavering expressions. Rebecca held the door, looking out to the stars and thinnest drapings of clouds. So very high, the door closed. They walked on hoarfrost to the dodge dart parked haphazard in the driveway and grass blotched lawn. She surveyed this, and now everything done this week, in unreadiness. Honestly, now, she thought to herself of when exactly the unreadiness had been playing to the finish. When she parked the car at twelve o'clock noon, returning from the police station, she knew. When Charlie left for work and he didn't come back, and before the first day she met him, and when the sardonic jester made a balloon out of the sky. She was six. Her father didn't understand, so he says, It was just a commercial. I don't see what you're so upset about. 
In fact, it was a commercial for N-E-S-T-L-E-S, -E which he never had in his house again. So did he have an inkling? She came back from the sound of crystals crunching as they walked, put Kenny in the back seat, watched the last plume of breath in the chill November, closed the cold out, walked to the front, got in, started the car, and held on against isolation. Where are we going? asked Kenny. Out to dinner, don't you remember? Oh, then nothing. She admired for a moment his thoughtful silence as he studied the shadow of the glove compartment. Because I want us to do something special tonight. She couldn't hold back the echo in her mind. Because it's just us. The drive was silence. The lights became more common. More houses, more stores, more red lights and green lights. Then to the restaurant. An oblivious crowd sedated on food and darkness. A knowing waitress smiled alertly and sat them with a compliment for Kenny. A glance to Rebecca, a swift turn and knowing steps. Rebecca turned to her son. What do you want, dear? Do you want spaghetti this time? You can have whatever you want. There were two darknesses. Rebecca's and the world's. Rebecca's was a nos. Darkness was a nosis. She saw it always, no more now really to be in a dimly lit restaurant than high noon, surrounded by darkness. She was the greater one, that dim consciousness of blind darkness, food and sleep swallowed. Well, that's the very reason she knew she was unaware. She had one up on the world. Hers was like moonlight shimmering off the sea. Ripples of faint light, all around her world she was the scenery. She was the backdrop, the silhouette that framed the tangible. Her second continuum, a mall of voices, light shimmering off forks, the intuited statistics of forks rising and falling. She could perhaps tell us. She could rip her breast out of her shirt, stab it with a fork, douse her chicken parm with raw human blood, feed it to the stray kitties out back by the dumpster. The government could also produce the spaceship from Area 51. Silence was part of that darkness, her second continuum. Kenny was not in that discussion. His darkness could be fixed with a nightlight. Kenny got his coke, sat up to the table, that was still high for him, took the half wrapper off the straw, decided he did want spaghetti. Rebecca awaited her breakfast of chicken parm and garlic bread, drifted along on what Kenny needed to be told. He took up wrapping his spoon on the table rhythmically. Ta 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 she drifted along. It blocked out all the noise, all the chatter, all her thoughts, then finally just one emerged. I've taken his life. No fanfare, no fear, she felt for him. He was in her thumb. So nice to have him here. It's been so hard, I thought I lost him. I never wanted to lose him. I never will. He's right here. What truth did she, could she possibly tell him? That he was dead for sure, in some way he, couldn't under he could understand. The truth was his father left from work, turned up within a week dead, and died stupidly in a bar fight, with the lurid hint, if you wanted to read it that way, that he had died somehow earlier. And it was just a matter of the personality running out of its momentum. The warning signs were his cracking around the seams, and conspicuously protecting his family from whatever danger he was privy to. Then he left, silently, Kafka-esque, ran into death as though that was all that was left for him to do. Rebecca's great crime wasn't ignoring him. She didn't cheat on him. She loved him. But she had taken something from him. On some point, she really didn't understand. It wasn't his blood. She didn't drink his blood like Dracula's sister. His flesh. It was mysterious to her that whatever it was was now hers and the awareness attached was within her, and would never leave. Some whatever was now hers. Why the manager was approaching their table, she tried to think. Did we get a free prize? Did I break something? Do I have my purse? Your child is disturbing, disturbing the customers, ma'am. The waitress was following him and sat down the plates between them, breaking the little abruptness that Rebecca suddenly felt coming back to the moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Kenny, dear, if you could stop maybe with the drumming. It was 6 p.m. in November, and it was damn cold. 
Any place can freeze the bones, and the soul's house is in the bones. So the cold freezes eternity, woe betide. These things we've done away with in religion. We put a screen up, and God doesn't play dice, and we know that's how things must be. But maybe Conan was right. Maybe bronze statues and silver statues do walk and talk, have eyes to see. Maybe they are dead and cruel and terrible, petty and lustful, like us. Driving from the restaurant, after they both had ice cream, through New Hampshire desolation, overhanging branches and loneliness, cut off from the lights, the road got quieter. Kenny fell asleep in the front seat, toppled eventually to one side, the seat felt holding him up. And Rebecca got so much lonelier, she could go on forever in a way, be under a charge, not that she didn't expect sad truths. She just had a kind of energy. She had overcome something. It seemed limitless. Now that this range of her self-mastery found a limit, she haplessly found herself in the unknown. It got quieter. The moon, first quarter moon, commanded the horizon. It looked like God made a surrealistic sickle and just fashioned it to the heavens to fuck with our natural instinct to have a rational explanation. The limbs of trees overhanging the road would divide the moon into small shards. She would wait with all her heart for the silver specter to still be there. It became a journey within a journey, one of driving home on a cold Tuesday evening, and one of the maniac dance that song requires. She noticed the stars now. She looked for her constellation, the scorpion, its face all that was visible and sinking at the foot of the archer. Up the driveway, the gravel crumbling beneath the tires, she unfastened Kenny, carried him through the door, put him to sleep on the couch, made herself a cup of instant coffee, grabbed her cigarettes, walked out the back door. She sat right on the ground, unflushed her sleeves from the coat. The cold hit her without hesitation, whistled through her chest, her heart slowed and sped, insecure of its new surroundings. Her hands clenched of their own. She unclenched them, lit up a cigarette, felt the frost crystals under her, let the smoke out. She stayed here under the canopy of stars, myth open myth passed over her. She lasted out the cold, she welcomed the chill, invited it in until it disarmed by her posture. She watched the great bear, the sun's bed, his dark wife, mistress of his hiding. The Universe there was a chasm. There had been other chasms. Perhaps they weren't any different. No bigger, not more serious. Not that Rebecca had suddenly suddenly been asked to regress to a geocentric ideology, to cleave to Marxism, to deny Christ to the count of three. This chasm, nevertheless, was a certain one, a simple one, understated to the point of satire, the gulf unbridgeable between the ideal and the actual, the schism we all must come to terms with. If we think of Sylvia Plath, that being the only actual substance, and looking around for any substantial objects, finding not one, no anything to hold on to, and nothing to sink into, there is Rebecca. When she fell as a little girl and realized something wasn't how it was supposed to be, that the procession of equinoxes was due to the skewedness of the earth, not some divine workmanship. Still, maybe there was some truth she didn't yet fathom. After all, everyone else seemed to go on like things that are as they should be. Now, at the final term of high school, what, who had an answer? Everyone denied the problem. Because to accept it was madness. Basketball was more than just a game. But games weren't more than basketball. She didn't know if she heard what she thought she heard. She got lost for a lurid moment. Her girlfriend from third period math asked her, How does this muzzle look on me? Something was stirring. All through the year, she watched a bright, enthusiastic 17-year-old girl get silent. She was dying. Rebecca tried to picture what it was eating her from the inside out. Had an inkling it was from home, or conformity, or fear of something. Then she just came up on Rebecca like she knew she was being observed in this. Like Rebecca could share in this hidden tragedy, but then approaching her watcher, she felt 
What was between them was a tragedy and a tragedy. Two negative makes a positive. Then logically, two positives would make a negative. Strange we can speak of these things, right, Rebecca? The negative two universe. What do you believe? What do you preach? Follow all those parables and maxims to their conclusions. It's madness. Rebecca has found slim comfort in acceptance, her heresy. But power truly belongs to what we serve. A light shined into the darkness and comprehended the darkness. There was a chasm. The woodstock had passed. Things began to get brighter. Things started becoming face value again. Rebecca still hadn't found the world, and it looked like she never would. She was side reel, clinging to the winter sun, and the sun at the course of midnight. She couldn't surrender to lunacy for its simple drunkenness. She had no message to bear like Hermes. She was not much for the Venusian, being quite dispassionate about the whole deal. Her star was the sun, and its indirect course at that. And now one wanted to play the game with her. They were only playing at it anyway, like dress up. And now things were becoming what they were. August heralded February. She had no Oak King. Her Oak King did find her. She was living happily, too happily to notice it. They had a child, and her Oak King began to yield to darkness, like all Oak Kings do. And she started to understand. She was Rebecca twice great having two parts of the wisdom of the whole world. Earth to Andromeda Jera, do you think she's a little flaky? Or, I don't know, loose maybe is the word? I know I shouldn't say those things, but there's no nice way to put it. A nice way would be to say you're attracted to her. Do you find loose women attractive there, Chucky? Jera looked across the yard at Rebecca, who was caught between the twilight and the cooler in such a way that it seemed like a portrait, an artist's rendering of the eternal and the ephemeral. Jera admired open-heartedly such a morbid beauty that it could shine without reservation or pride. Rebecca just seemed to be in hollow in some way. Jera looked back at the rest of the people at her party to try and put a finger on what was unique about this figure swallowing up her and Charlie's attention. Everyone was talking, holding their drinks, alive, and though this lone figure was doing nothing of the sort, still that wasn't it. Charlie was close, but flaky wasn't the whole truth either. Well, I don't usually find... Go over and talk to her, interrupted Jera. But what if she's high-strung or, you know, emotional? I don't think so. Besides, you're not much of a catch. I think she is. Thanks, Charlie bit on his sarcasm. Walking over to her, he felt a pull, something in his stomach turning into peace. The foliage around him as he walked seemed full of fairy whispers that he recognized hearing for the first time. Rebecca looked up at him, seemed aware of all of it, and looked deeply into him, with no regard for anything penetrating and transcendent. He felt the force of fate as he got closer. He felt it. It asked him if he resigned to fate, if he would accept this burden of the Lord in full knowledge. He answered, it seemed the real thing to measure his existence by. He waited for such a question, an opportunity to become real. Through all this was on his mind, he barely knew it or understood. He simply said yes somehow and left it at that. Rebecca looked away timidly, realizing he was approaching her. He stopped short, there was still an opportunity to turn around. No, he thought to himself, there is no room to turn around, there's nothing to turn around into. He feared her like reality itself. You're sitting here alone, there's a party happening. He asked her, looking at her sitting on a lawn chair, the stars now beginning to flick in the indigo sky above. Because God is dead. Oh, don't think that way, he's not dead. Oh yeah, Charlie, I get it, we're all in this together, and all that shit, right? I got ya. How do you know my name is Charlie? A little astounded. His eyes widened a bit. He looked at her to her and wanted to hear a fairy tale. He started reaching for one of his own thoughts, going quickly through what he most wanted to believe and the reality that he was able to accept as possible. Rebecca breached a smile, started to laugh a little. Kindly, as though she had found someone in the same boat, the life had just offered her a pick-me-up, and she was smart enough to catch on. Your name really is Charlie, isn't it? Yes, but you know how. 
Haha, ha, she threw her head back and became intoxicated on the air itself. Her hair fell over her face and she transformed between one second and the next. She became beautiful with a moment's notice. The light in her eyes softened, invisible cares and the shadows of naught made haste. Charlie, fuck, hi Charlie, how the hell are you? His fairy tale ended, untold, and he turned and walked away. Come back, Charlie, come back. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sorry, I'm stuck, stuck. Stuck up, I can't say that. He's going, call him back. He's touch, no. I won't sit and... Something was stuck. This is how I can say hi. Stuck. Bye, Charlie. Rebecca thought to herself. What did you say to her? Charlie was looking extra dignified on approaching the doorsteps of concrete where Jerry was sitting on the third topmost step, bearing some resemblance in character to the weather-worn concrete. Charlie immediately turned to look at where Rebecca had been. Her back was turned, and she was collecting her possessions, a handbag, and keys. And walking out, he watched her leave now, and she looked so patiently beleaguered. He wasn't sure if he felt warmth or cold from her back turned to him. I don't know. I really don't know. I thought he could think of no way to finish his sentence. None of it made sense. I should have just laughed with her. She was laughing at my name. Why, what's so funny about your name to her? Jarrah asked. What's not funny about it, Jarrah? He turned with her in a strange mock expression. She was about to take a drink and laughed over the rim of her beer. The wind blew in omen. Charlie had been hearing it. That's not all there is. Do you know? He wanted to cover himself. Go back a while. He could be... He still could. But all he could do was accept the invitation, and there was nothing to go back to. There hadn't been for a while. The night crept on, and Rebecca and the fire of the sun buried deep within him. Charlie became drawn away. Stay down. It was Friday. Rebecca had the weekend planned. There would be a trip to the farmer's market. Saturday morning cartoons, grocery shopping, a movie, the library. Kenny ate and caught the bus, and the sunlight was just perfect. For all that, Rebecca saw on the horizon she never saw it coming. She was too enamored with the world and that never accepted her and never would. It seemed now that it had and that she had entered the so-called land of the living and been welcomed as one of its own. What if all that we hold as life is death in its early stages? Rebecca couldn't help it, to be fair. When she had been part of the... <coughs> election committee, organizing addresses, getting smiles that seemed approving for getting smiles that seemed approving for once. To th see the same faces she had always saw, always been impressed by, welcoming her. She was an upstanding woman, as she stooped to them. How can anyone be so sure of themselves to battle the measureless beast, and how for so long she got a few too many sparkling bones dangled in her face and held over her head. She thought she could belong to that universe. She found all the people who had sown such subtle poisons in her spirit and made peace with them at the cost of her salvation and the profit of nothing, betraying her convictions and her God at the bank with the letters to the editor. Amongst the sports bar, she was open and didn't imagine it. Kenny had not acted out, had very densely watched his words with more awareness than she could be than she what could be used against his mother. But none of that mattered. The problem was in her being known. When it was for her an isolated few that would be that she would open up, she couldn't be proven as much of anything, and the school was barely conscious of her thoughts. Now everybody was beginning to put a name to a face, and the wrong people were getting on. That she was a little on the bent way. She watched some daytime TV, had ice cream, went to work, she spent her day cleaning at the hotel, had enough time to her own, thought a lot about nothing, enjoyed her place. She had no ambition for anything else. It struck her that this cleaning up messes in a half-rate hotel might be the kind of thing people would try to get off as soon as they could. Should she be doing more to have money for her son's education, something 
She wondered about as she dressed linens on the mattresses that strange people from who knows where had left various scents on a white sheet, tucked tight perfect. First square sheet, then blanket. This is one that has a cigarette burn at the foot. Haven't seen it in a week. That's about usual. She floated along. She could have known that Kenny was being pulled out of his last period class. A social worker would have him placed in a foster home before she got to meet her. She could have, but she might have just as been helpless. She didn't find him at home. She called the school. Yes, um, you haven't been told, um, Miss Cortland. I'm going to give you the number of Miss Ramsey at the Department of Social Services. Kenny's safe, don't worry, nothing's happened to him. I really hate to be the one to have to tell you this. Rebecca was crying silently between her teeth. You goddamn bitch, you fucking godless whore. Fuck, fuck you. She got through to Kenny's caseworker. She said that Rebecca knew when they were taking emergency custody of Kenny that there would be a family court hearing on the 14th. Social Services is going to ask for psychiatric evaluations of her and her son to determine her psychological state and whether Kenny had been traumatized by Rebecca's problems. Goodbye. She escaped to the movies, didn't eat, had a coke, left halfway through the show, didn't have any idea about what it was about. The sky had grown completely black, black as the soul's slayer. She stood outside, chain-smoking, listening to people talking and smoking. She didn't want to go home because nothing was there, and she would crack. She had to get something together, some raft to weather the sea. She started listening to these women, in contrast of their depth of color as their clothes held against the pitch depth of the vacant sky, and the stars reckoned with them. She started becoming absorbed in them. They seemed to smile at the truth. It was like an angel came to give a illumination in the darkest hour. And the first words she picked, But how far apart are they? The woman on the left asked. She had the darker colored hair and the lighter colored cloths. Other ends of the galaxy as far as Charlie's concerned. Oh, now you're getting all philosophical and mixing metaphors. No, the lady with the brighter clothes said as they... S something clarified. Life is magical. I mean, think about it. Two turns into three, and how? We have a sense of mathematical, certainly, but it's really a miracle. So if it starts out magical, then the whole thing's a mysterious magical journey. If that's not sorcery, it's something else, not life. The other lady poised an understatement. You're too much, shaking her head, smiling. Rebecca clenched her right hand into a fist. So tightly, she thought she would break her own hand, let it out slowly and evenly. Each fingernail mark glimmered in her eyes, and she went forth. Journal Entry Final When I was about four, there was a time when I had to do what I knew I couldn't. I had to jump into nothing. My father was still alive, and me and him and my mom were at this river. It was really beautiful. And there was a high bank at the top of it you would be over a person's head if they were standing at the bottom. I climbed up where it wasn't steep and I was head level with my parents. I don't know what started the idea, but my father was the first to say it. He told me to jump down and my mother would catch me. I was always scared of, in a way of her. It must have been shown. She seemed to have a contempt for me when my father was still alive. And I felt like I knew why, but I couldn't put my finger on it, like I understood intuitively. And then she would suddenly, out of the clear blue, play a game with me, and I felt okay just to be a child. That she understood me so much more perfectly than anyone could. I never understood her distance or what it meant, but I understood her apology when she would take the time with me. I was a fine, always so. So I had this fear of her, and what was and what she saw through in me. I, could, I couldn't see through her, and my father tells me to jump, and she'll catch me. And she didn't laugh, smile, frown. I'm five feet above her. I had no other information. My mother is gone now. She took flight. The trial went on. I moved in with Jara, who tells me nothing on the subject of my mother. Because of all I know, no one can explain her to her son. The easy answer is that she would have to change into someone more acceptable, 
as a mother in society's view. She would have to kill the person who is my mother, and replace her with a woman who doesn't think too deeply about whether there is a world before her eyes. Well, that might not be why she left. I have no other information to go on. I go past the house that used to be ours. It's been almost a year. This really nice family moved in. The daughter is in my homeroom. I, comf I comfortably and invisibly watch them. They seem to make themselves happy. The mother is blonde, hair cut a bit down her shoulders. She comes home from work, and a lot of times there's this way she looks before she opens the door like she is afraid in a way that things are good. Maybe they haven't always been. Then she gathers herself up and walks through. If no one lived there, if just one person instead of a family, I think it would make my world darker. The last time I saw her was at the supervised visit in the social service building. The social worker kept going on with small talk and things that had nothing to do with what was going on, and my mom looked well contained. You've done a great job with Kenny. He's such a great kid, and my mom just plays along and all. Then she asked me if I remember my father, and I had an idea that this was when we'd say goodbye. Yeah, I said. We used to really love each other so much. You didn't see it, maybe. I know you don't remember a lot about him. You were so little then. I could remember her poking him in the cheek with a letter opener. So how do you like communism, Chucky? When we were at the shelf and they were below me, he told me I could trust her. And like it was some sort of cue, she turned around, so her back was to the shelf, and we were both looking forward. She started to smile, and that's so rare for her. It was this deep, living smile. It glowed on me. God, Kenny, I want you to find someone in this life. There's someone who deserves you. You're so good. It's so cold in this world, and people are as far apart as stars sometimes. But that's not how it really is. We're so much closer to each other than that. Mrs. Cortland interrupted the social worker. Maybe we could go get a soda, my treat. It was so warm when we were at the park, and there was dew and dampness moving in the warm air. As I looked down over her, it came a reassurance. I couldn't explain it to myself. I felt the force of her whole life, something that she could never say, and I couldn't prove it. But there it was, all over her face, in her arms, glaring of my father stirring in me how it might have been nothing i jumped went past her face i leapt into the chasm into the cheshire cat smile with which she greeted her decades and she caught me the stars have no life they move in a barren circuit west to east and nature is the unconsciousness of the witch al majid